Spirit Spotlight Art Talks highlight member and friend artists of all ages and experiences. So, um, welcome everyone to Any Squared Spotlight. We're excited tonight because we have Kao Razen, who is a dear friend of Any Squared. Um, and uh, I met him through the International Art Group. Uh, uh, our friend Mariana, Mariana, who's on the, on the call, uh, is somebody who introduced me to Kao, and I also know him as Kenya. His his legal name. <laughs> so did you use my government name? I'm kidding. <laughs> so we're, I mean, tonight we're going to talk about uh, a lot of different things about him. He's a poet. He's a rapper. He does music. He does performance art. He does visual art. He's an all around interdisciplinary artist and a curator and he's organized a lot of events and different things this is something that we both have in common is organizing things and bringing people together is something that is really important to you yes. you have a hit and i i and one of the things that uh i want to know a little more about is like your formative years how you became an artist what motivates you as an artist and mm -hmm. i'll start with that so Go ahead, Kale. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tracy and uh, Any Squared uh, for having me. Um, it's it's an honor. Um, I appreciate you doing this series of of, of talks and uh, showcasing uh, Chicago artists of all dis disciplines and ages. And uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Yeah. We're excited uh, to have you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, well. My artist name is Ko Razen. Um, Ko, uh, a lot of people just address me as that. Uh, my 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 government name is uh, Kenya, and um, I was born and raised in Chicago. Grew up on the the South Side. Um, grew up in a uh, Stateway Gardens, which was a uh, a, a housing project uh, on the uh, South Side, in between like 35th and State and 39th and State. So across the Dan Ryan from a uh, Comiskey or whatever it's called now, Guarantee Rayfield. And um, so uh, growing up there, I lived there until I was about 15. And, um, you know, there was just a lot of music always around the house. My mother was a singer. Uh, my grandmother played bass guitar. Uh, my uncle's like a multi-instrumentalist and a producer. And um, so there was just always music. My mother had a, a, a huge like a record collection. There were eight tracks when cassettes came along. We had cassettes and, um, you know, I still remember specific cassettes I would listen to. Uh, she had like the police, like uh, the singles <laughs> uh, cassette. So it was kind of like the greatest hits in a way. So I would listen to that a lot. You know, a lot of Rick James, a lot of Prince, uh, Sugar Hill Gang, Dana Dane, just, just a wide range of uh, musical uh, genres and influences. Uh, my mother had a huge uh, book collection so there was a lot to read. So I did a lot of reading and listening to music. And I, I think that really kind of helped uh, crystallize the, the, the base of what would become uh, K.O. Razan, the artist. Um, so I, I was born in the mid 70s. So, uh, you know, by the early to mid 80s, you know, hip hop was kind of like a big thing. So, you know, a lot of in my neighborhood, there were a lot of, you know, DJs, a lot of rappers. So I started rapping at a very early age uh, as far as, you know, writing raps or just kind of performing to myself in my room. Uh, I would write like poetry. I would write like songs. Uh, I would draw like I read a lot of comic books. Uh, so I would draw a lot of like characters. So a lot of time at home, you know, but since it was Stateway Gardens, uh, it wasn't always safe to be like out and about outside and everything because of, uh, you know, gangs and, 
and uh, things like that. So uh, if I was in the house, a lot of my time was spent reading, reading comic books, listening to music, drawing, just whatever, whatever a kid does at that age with a imagination, you know. So what were the different kinds of things you were doing more in your youth in terms of art, like, like as you were coming of age? Okay. Um, well, I think at, at a certain point, I started to feel as serious as a young person could feel about being like a performer or being a rapper. It, it felt kind of serious for me. Um, I would perform in a lot of um, talent shows like in the neighborhood or, or at school. And uh, I, I, I just started writing kind of on a regular basis. So, you know, I had like a you know, notebooks that would be full of like poetry or songs or, or raps. And, um, you know, I had like different like rap aliases I would like come up with over the years. Uh, some of them are kind of uh, hilarious. <laughs> and uh, uh, Some of them I'm not going to mention at all. Maybe. <laughs> mention some, mention some. Right, I'll mention some, I'll mention some. Um, one early rap name was Kid Chaos. And, you know, that's kind of like an early um, version of what would become like K.O. Razin. Um, before that, I had, uh, there was um, Def F, you know, yeah, Def, D-E-F, space F, Def F, you know. Uh, there's the rapper Def Jeff, and uh, <laughs> Def was a thing that, you know, Def Jam Records. So, uh, yeah, I, I was probably Def F at about eight or nine years old. Um, uh, probably the most embarrassing rap name that I ever had was uh, FF Cool K. <laughs> yeah, Brent, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, there was LL Cool J, you know. So I don't know, it, it, in some moment of complete insanity when I was uh, maybe nine or something, you know, for a little while I was a, uh, FF Cool K. The FF stood for Firebird Fulton, which was another. <laughs> this is beautiful. Love yeah, it. Yeah. I love this. You didn't know you were going to get all this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, but, but see, that's the thing. A lot of us, a lot of rappers, you spend like your, a lot of your life trying to come up with the right name, you know? Um, so yeah, I went through that whole process. And um, the first name that really stuck for me was uh, Apollo, Apollo Kenton. And um, I was wondering where that came from because I remember seeing that name here and there. That's right. Well, yeah, well, uh, Apollo, that was probably the early to mid 90s when I, when I um, started using that name. And when I joined the Nacrobats Hip Hop Collective, I was known as Apollo or Apollo Kenton. So a lot of them still uh, address me as Apollo. And uh, Apollo, I, I read a lot of Greek mythology as a kid and uh, Apollo was like my favorite God. I don't even think I was cared so much about the whole God of music and art. I don't think I was thinking so much about that. Uh, it, but um, I just, you know, the name, there's something about the name that, that, that uh, appealed to me. And Kenton was kind of like Kenya Fulton. So that was like, combining my first and last name. So Apollo Kenton. Um, so I, I, I was rapping and stuff on my own. I did like demos with my uh, uncle. He had like a four track uh, recording set up. And uh, so, you know, I did I remember those. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> full track. Yeah, full track is king. And uh, you know, I might play y'all a little snippet of a four track something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, in 1995, uh, you know, I was um, I, I, I was 20 uh, in that year, and you know, I'm 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 a, I'm a, I'm a becoming a man, I guess, uh, around that time, um, and that's that's the same year that I joined the Nacrobats Hip Hop Collective. Uh, the Nacrobats uh, was founded by Pugs Adams. Um, Pugs is kind of well known, well known on the like Chicago hip hop scene. Uh, Kind of known internationally, uh, very, uh, very, very busy, very uh, also multidisciplinary. Uh, he's a, a, a visual artist, a fashion designer, 
all kinds of stuff, dope, dope rapper. So Pugs founded the Knackerbats uh, at Kenwood Academy, I believe in 1993. And um, so it just started out as some friends at the school uh, getting together and rapping and things like that. Um, I would see them around here and there, you know, maybe in like groups sometimes, you know, they'd like, I was working on a dinner boat at Navy Pier and, you know, I'd see like this group of people coming down the pier and like, like, who the hell are these dudes? You know, they, they walk around, I think they own the place or whatever, you know, um, cause that's how a lot of hip hop crews walked around Chicago at around that time. Um, in 1995, um, I, I don't even remember exactly like how I connected. I just remember I, I went from seeing them all the time everywhere till like, okay, now I'm Nacrobats, <laughs> you know, I'm a member of the Nacrobats. And um, at that time, uh, Nacrobats, no one was really recording just yet. Uh, so a lot of the first Nacrobat recordings were done around that time, as far as I know. Um, uh, we would meet up uh, at Harold Washington Library. We would meet up at Navy Pier. Uh, Nacrobats was made up of rappers, break dancers, DJs, graffiti artists. So sometimes we meet up and just kind of go around the city. People be putting their tags up everywhere or we just be ciphering wherever we were. Uh, that's basically what we did. We met up and we just ravaged through the streets of the city. Uh, painting on everything, writing our names on everything, and uh, destroying whack MCs. Uh, Nacrobats stands for never allow crab rappers opportunities because all toys suck. Yes. Not literal like toys that you play with or whatever, but like, you know, uh, I think it, like a rapper that's like not dope, they're a toy or something like that. <laughs> um, so we would meet. Uh, we would we would meet at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. There were a couple of Nacrobat members that attended the school in 1995, and there was like a little uh, studio at the school that was, you know, for the students, and it had like a four-track um, cassette recorder in there. So we uh, met up one day, and a bunch of us. Uh, the guy, this guy, just played a beat, and whoever was there, we just all kind of rapped on it. So one song has like whoever was there at that time, then the next song has whoever was there that 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 next time. And those were the first Nacrobat recordings that that I was on. Um, sometime after that, I recorded a solo song with the producer. And I could play a little bit of that if you want. Oh, please, please, please. Uh, can I just play it? And will you guys pick up the audio or do I need to do the share screen? So I think if it's on the audio, you may, let's, let's try. Can you hear that? You know the name of Apollo Kent and blows up the spot. I'm known for keeping it real with the skills. You ain't got whether or not you got your voice that don't matter. I got a spiritual essence to climb the ladder of success. I press myself to be the hype and the vices on the mic. I push my buttons in the pipe. So tell your psychics, their predictions, that he can come. That's just a, that's just a little snippet. You could you know go back and check it out. That's on my uh, Bandcamp page, which you can access from my website, uh, on from any page on my website. The icons to all my like social media and Bandcamp and everything are at the top. Uh, so that song, you know, is very minimal. It's just like a a a, a, a loop of a beat, uh, scratching um, a, a, a vocal sample, and uh, just you know, my vocals, so very, very minimal. So that was like kind of the sound of the recordings we were doing at, at, at the time. Um, uh, to, uh, the 1995, the year I joined the Nacrobats was also the year that my oldest uh, child was born, uh, Imani Amori Randall Fulton. Uh, so 
that, you know, at that point in my life, yeah, you know, I was kind of had some new responsibilities that I was kind of taking on and, you know, but I was still, you know, being creative. Uh, but uh, most of the Nacrobats or all of them were maybe a couple of years younger than me. So, you know, I think I was kind of starting to deal with some, um, you know, just more kind of serious adult uh, responsibilities. Um, though I was able, uh, when Pugsley Adams released his album a few years later, and then the uh, Centric IE, who's a like associate uh, act of the Nacrobats, I was on like their first like releases back then, like in the mid to late 90s, like those early Nacrobat tapes. So I was on all of that stuff. Um, so even in the years where I wasn't like really active on like the art scene in, in any kind of capacity, you know, I feel like I was always kind of doing enough to where people kind of heard me at least every now and then on, on something. Um, so how did I, becoming a dad like affect that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is kind of, I want to understand your history a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, becoming a dad definitely affected like me as, as an artist uh, and everything. I think as I was taking on like these adult responsibilities, uh, you know, I was just kind of looking at things more seriously. I was very early in my, uh, my career as a uh, professional mariner on, um, you know, I started working on passenger vessel boats in 1992. Uh, my first child was born in 95. So I was very early in my career. Uh, over the next few years, I had like two more children. I got married. And so, uh, you know, I kind of was focusing on my career and my family, you know, so uh, I didn't finish school at the time I was going to Columbia College, Chicago. But, you know, over the years, I, you know, I was painting and drawing at home, you know, I was uh, recording, I recorded an album with a couple of uh, friends of mine, uh, Willie and John, we had a group called Crucible Culture. We weren't really performing out anywhere, but we always over the course of a few years, we just recorded like a lot of material uh, just because we love doing it. And, um, you know, I, I kind of, I bought like a keyboard and I started figuring out, I didn't know anything about music, but it's like, okay, if I press this key and then this one and then do that, it kind of sounds okay, you know? So um, a lot of the Crucible Culture uh, songs were recorded from like 1998 to 2005. And some of those songs are on my band camp as well. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we're going to release it in a more definitive form at some point. Uh, you know, so look for that maybe over the next year or two or so. But some Crucible Culture songs are online now. Um, so I, you know, raising my family, raising, uh, raising my kids and everything working, but I would still occasionally go to open mics. I was still writing, I was still drawing, painting, recording. Uh, maybe around uh, 2013 is when my life as an artist kind of took like a, a, sh a shift, you know, uh, in 2013, that's the year that I met, uh, Mariana Buvald. And, um, that's also the year that I joined the, uh, for Keith Saraya, uh, dance troupe, uh, which like a, a belly dance troupe at all Harbor palace. So I, okay. With, 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 with meeting Mariana Buvald and joining IAG, her, uh, the, the Loose Collective that she founded, International Arts Group. Uh, so being a part of IAG and a part of the Furkit Saraya belly dance troupe, you know, those kind of experiences kind of took me out my comfort zone, you know, being a rapper or being a whatever. Okay, now I'm kind of like a backup dancer to like some belly dancers. And, you know, I'm learning like, steps and kicks and stuff and I'm not a professional dancer but everybody else is they're professional dancers but they don't mind me being a part of the troupe and you know I'm learning some things and I didn't you know. know you were a dancer <laughs> well, well, <laughs> I don't know everything about you this is new oh, see I told you you're gonna get some gold yeah uh, <laughs> so um so for a few years like yeah so being a part of that I'm kind of um you know, they're, they're putting on like these weekly shows at Alhambra Palace and I'm involved in like different capacities. And so you're seeing them basically put a show together. They're, you know, choreography or their, their, their dance uh, movements, uh, the music that's being played, 
uh, you know, there's lighting and, and, you know, the smoke and everything. So it's like, you know, kind of like a production, you know, in a sense. So being able to see that coming together and becoming friends with like these dancers who like rehearsed like every week or a couple of times a week. And they were very serious about what they, what they did and their, their, their craft and their, 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 uh, and then the history attached to uh, the cultures of the dances that, that they were doing. Um, and though it doesn't directly overlap with like some of my stuff, I feel like I definitely learned a lot from that experience as far as like putting together like a production, you know, and the whole uh, physical um, aspect of performing, you know, gestures and facial expressions and, and, and all of that. So I think that really helped me kind of like fine tune a lot of uh, my own performance things in my, in my mediums, you know. And, uh, and then, you know, I've collaborated with uh, some of the dancers and other things to, uh, as far as like performance art or actual music performances. Um, so definitely being able to have that experience uh, really helped me evolve as an artist. And then uh, with Mariana Buvold being involved with her and the International Arts Group, uh, curating like art shows at the uh, Donk House from like uh, 2000, 13 into 2018. So, uh, you know, looking at all these, uh, looking at art submissions coming in from artists throughout Chicago or from Germany and, you know, deciding what's gonna work best for the show and what should we put where and, and being able to kind of focus on those kind of things. Uh, I really enjoy that because it's kind of, you know, as artists, we stress so much about our own art, you know, there's like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, I'm working on my own stuff. And it's, you know, it's kind of, you're kind of in that headspace and all the whatever that comes with that. So being able to like focus on showcasing the work of other people is something I enjoy very much because it kind of takes me outside of like all the, you know, the worrying about my own stuff and I could focus on like something else. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed uh, hanging other people's artwork and then deciding like, oh, what's going to look right next to it. And then also curating like not just the visual exhibition, but like uh, the things that are going to take place over the month that this exhibition is up. So there's going to be like performances going on maybe uh, during the month that the, the paintings are up. There are going to be like uh, art workshops and having this network of artists that I'm connected with that are willing to uh, teach a workshop or perform or, you know, so with IAG, it really helped me expand like my network of uh, the artists that I knew beyond just knowing like rappers and poets and, and things like that. That's where I met you as a curator and part of IAG. Mm -hmm. And also, and I knew less about your music at that mm -hmm. time, because I knew you through that. And also you coming to our studio and doing figure drawing coming to some of our sessions here at mm -hmm. uh, any squared um i think that that it's it's kind of been interesting to see what you've been making in the last few years mm -hmm. like because i didn't know you did that too and that's actually more of a part of who you are and doing poetry and also rap all of that stuff i knew less about you in that in that context so um, I think that that that's interesting. I, I met you at a little snippet of time. <laughs> well, yeah, I think depending on when people meet me, they yeah, they really don't know a lot about, you know, what I do or some of the things I've always been involved in. Because even when when people didn't know that I was really doing music and stuff, I've always had like a home studio like for the last I don't know, a lot of years of my life, you know, I always had like some kind of music equipment or something to kind of play with some sounds and put something together or strum something out on a guitar and build from that. So even, you know, there was, I, I wasn't the kind of person that was just walking around, hey, I'm a rapper, yeah, you know, um, I, you know, that, that just wasn't me. So a lot of people didn't know. Um, but I think once my children became adults and kind of kind of got off into the world to kind of you know start becoming the people they're going to be um you know that freed me up in a lot of ways but i always kind of looked at it like that I, I told my son a few days ago 
he's a, a 22 now. Uh, I told him, you know, I just, I hope you know that when you guys were kids, I never looked at like having kids as like holding me back or anything like that. I always felt like, ah, I'll just be an artist when they grow up, you know, like I always kind of felt like that, you know? Uh, so I think I didn't really have that stress like, oh, I, I, I have to prove myself or I got to do it right now or whatever, you know, life is a, hopefully a, a long journey for all of us and you know it takes the entirety of that life to become who we're going to become and i think I always kind of looked at it that way um, um i think part of that I'll, I'll, i'm going to go back to and talk a little bit about the name ko rosin and mm -hmm. i think it connects to maybe how i look at kind of some things i was going to ask you about that because i know karma said names are important they have magic Yes, 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 yeah. And yeah. then the other thing, is, and in addition to that, is also like kind of what your personal, what things in your personal life have influenced your work, what what affects you in terms mm -hmm. of your work, and why you make work. This is these are the kinds of questions I have right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, in 1998, I, you know, I had been Apollo, Apollo Kenton. And, uh, but I kind of wanted to change. I wanted something more original, something that was more like mine and not like me using this other name, Apollo. And, you know, I just wanted something new. And it's something I meditated on for a while. And, uh, you know, I was reading a lot of like Eastern philosophy. Uh, my uh, my mother-in-law, who uh, my, my late mother-in-law, uh, Gail, she, she's, uh, she was Buddhist and, um, so since she was Buddhist, that meant that my wife was kind of Buddhist. So, uh, so I would, uh, you know, pick up some things from them and then a lot of stuff that I was reading at the time. So, you know, coming up with the name K.O. Ra Zen and then that Zen aspect, I don't consider myself like a Buddhist, you know, like, you know, but I think a lot of my own personal philosophy, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of things that I read in like uh, Eastern philosophy or um, not to try to say that I'm any kind of expert on like Zen Buddhism or anything like that, but just uh, at the core of what these philosophies are maybe supposed to be, I feel like there's a lot of overlap with maybe how I feel. Um, so, I, so I just kind of wanted to touch on that. So the KO was kind of evolution of the chaos. The Ra was me, you know, Amun Ra. So instead of Apollo, there's Ra, the Egyptian uh, sun god, and then the Zen kind of reflected a lot of stuff I was reading at the time, and it just kind of K.O. Ra Zen. It just kind of flowed to me, yeah, you know. And um, so I want to go back to that, but then, so over the last few years, um, after you know performing with the with the dancers at All Hamburg Palace, after you know going to Germany with Mariana and performing like, you know, wearing the mask uh, that her father made, uh, Hans Ulrich uh, Buwald, and uh, doing like these uh, performances with musicians and, and, and gestures. And, you know, at some point I kind of, I appreciated being a part of what other people were doing and learning and, but at some point you kind of want to do your, do your own thing, you know, like, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm cool. I, I like doing this, but let me do my, my thing more. So I started uh, setting an intention to be more serious about my performing as far as my spoken word and being more intentional about a lot of the things I was saying and doing. So I think, uh, so I'll sh maybe I can uh, share my screen so I could show like a couple of clips. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did share some of the promotional stuff of you dancing with Mariana. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have this queued up. Uh, this is from a um, performance I did in uh, 2019, February 2019, at the uh, Symphony Center with the uh, Chicago Modern Orchestra Project. Uh, and this was conducted by Renee, ba uh, Renee Baker. And Ooh, I love her. Yeah. <laughs> and Renee Baker, someone I met through. Mariana and IAG, and I emceed and hosted a screening of uh, some uh, films that uh, Renee Baker had did this, composed the scores to. So, you know, that's, you know, I, I kind of 
uh, started that relationship with her when she was putting this performance on. Um, I just sent her like a clip of me doing a spoken word piece. And like two weeks before she was supposed to do this show that she had been planning for months, like two weeks before she was like, hey, do you want to participate in the show? I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, uh, it kind of been on my bucket list to maybe perform at the Symphony Center. Um, so, all right, so I'm just going to play this clip. They want to act like they scared of us when we wear hoodies. When they've been trying to keep us hood winked, whether or not they wearing them white hoods. But they ain't got to wear them hoods no more. And they ain't interested in money's being invested in them hoods no more. And they don't want to be offering all them social services and goods no more. But when it's time for gentrification, all kinds of money for development makes itself most readily available. And now, you got new places to sip your lattes and practice Pilates. All right, so that was, uh, yeah, that was uh, from uh, uh, Midnight Ramble, the Baldwin Chronicles. Um, that was the name of the uh, entire uh, uh, event that uh, Renee Baker had put together and she was able to fit me in uh, at the end of the, like the performance uh, before like the big, uh, the big wrap up, the big, the fi big final number. So I really uh, appreciate her uh, letting me uh, be a, a part of that. And doing that performance, you know, I did, I've done a lot of open mics, done a lot of, been a feature poet at a lot of other things. And I treat everything the same, every performance, I try to give the same energy and, you know, but this kind of like, this felt different, like, oh, wow, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you know, kind of got to rock the mic at the symphony center. So it's kind of like, you know, you start thinking broader, you know, like, what all can I do to like reach more? Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a black man from the projects from the South side of Chicago, but the things I write, the things I say, I feel like they're for everybody, you know? Uh, so, you know, when I would perform at the Donk House, yeah, you know, it'd be a lot of, you know, elder Germans in the crowd or the, a whole, you know, mix of people. And I'm still like spitting my shit. Like I'd spit it like on a South side street corner, but to still have people be able to like connect to it. You know, that's kind of like my intention. It's like, I am who I am, I'm from where I'm from, but what I say is for like everybody. Um, so uh, I'll show this a little bit of this other clip. Uh, so this is from November, 2019. So later in the year, and um, this was part of the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago's uh, annual New Blood Festival. Uh, so with this performance, uh, I was able to work with a few of my creative friends to actually like, you know, kind of script out the whole performance, you know, to kind of like write down what the lighting uh, changes would be throughout the set. Uh, there, uh, there's the background, the backdrop, painted backdrop by Sarah P. Convery, uh, who's a, a friend of mine who I met also through the International Arts Group and Mariana. And, um, you know, expanding that net network, collaborating with other artists to maybe access certain nuances with my work that I wouldn't be able to do if it was just me standing up there performing by myself. So this is uh, an excerpt from Americans uh, from November, 2019. Burn books, burn beds, burn bridges. Burn candles, burn crosses, burn witches, burn flags, burn in hell, burn Hollywood, burn Babylon, burn. Burn books, burn beds, burn bridges, burn candles, burn crosses, burn witches, burn flags, burn in hell, burn Hollywood, burn Babylon, burn.
just want to show a little bit of that. And all these videos are on uh, YouTube, um, on my YouTube channel. You can access YouTube through uh, my website, uh, korazan.com. Um, and with, with the Americans performance, um, you know, so I, I started going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in uh, the fall of 2018. I accumulated enough credits to like transfer there uh, so I could finally get like uh, my bachelor's degree. And um, I had known about the New Blood Festival like the, you know, the, the previous year. And uh, so one of my goals when I, you know, was going to the Art Institute uh, was to be able to perform at this festival. You know, it's kind of like, well, I got to get in that so I could do a little something. And with this particular performance, so I was an older black guy going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, one of the things I noticed at the school uh, was, uh, you know, all, you know, so all of my classmates were so talented, you know, from all over the world, from all over the country. Uh, but, you know, I did kind of notice that, like, there weren't that many, like, Black students in a lot of my classes, or in a lot of my classes, I was the only one. And, um, yeah, that was something that was kind of like, wait a, minute, wait a minute, what about all the talented-ass kids, like, from the South Side and other areas in Chicago? Like, what's up with them, you know? Can they get into school? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, the money, you know. Um, so with, with this American's performance, um, I scripted it to be like 20 minutes. It wound up being about like 25 minutes. But I wanted it to include like my spoken word, music, the rap. Like, like I wanted it to be like a 20 minutes of like, I'm going to hit y'all with like everything I do in the midst of what everybody else are doing, the performance art that they're doing and and all the different things I want to be like, yeah, not just for this moment. Yeah, y'all doing what y'all doing, but this is what the fuck I do. And y'all going to this school, I'm actually from this city and these are the things I'm concerned about. You know what I'm saying? So that like that performance was just like me, like hitting them with like, like so much, as much as I could within like the 20 minutes, like, you know, a lot of like my best shit, like, um, like you know, the, the song Morning in America, uh, the poem, uh, The Legend of Lil' Kenny, uh, all of these different kind of works of mine, they kind of address like different things. 2244, which is a song I did with the band Hobbyist, which is about a domestic abuse. Uh, so I, you know, part of that. So I, I wanted to hit like, hit them with everything. And um, I've had people like respond to this performance and say, you know, people who like complimented me and said, oh man, yeah, it, it was great. I've had people tell me that, uh, Ooh, uh, someone told me that uh, it made them feel uncomfortable and, and everything, you know. So I knew that there would be like these different kinds of responses, you know, just with the maybe emotional intensity that I was delivering certain things and like then the audio, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, it was just loud and kind of blaring at points. So I, I, I'm sure um, for maybe more sensitive, I don't know. I mean, I just hit them with what I had and I, I didn't care. So within that performance, La Nina, Pinta y Santa Maria, that's kind of something I like wrote. And I kind of came up with something on the guitar. I told Professor K about it. So he created some music to it. Uh, Ana E, she like sang it and she wrote some additional lyrics to it too. But uh, here we just did the, the regular, you know, original lyrics that I wrote and just repeating that over and over. So I wanted to address all these different things. Uh, like my performance at the symphony center addressed like gentrification and different things like that. This performance kind of started up burn books, burn beds, burn bridges, burn, you know, burn flags. I'm kind of, you know, burning the purifying these things, destroying these symbols. And, you know, so just kind of, so a lot of my stuff does is political, I guess, and is like a, a huge part of, I guess, whatever my form of activism would, would be, which is not, I'm not always comfortable using that word, you know, activists. Um, I don't know. I think there are levels to it. So, you know, there's like the Fred Hampton <laughs> activists and then there's a lot of the rest of us, you know, so um, yeah. But but I do understand that the art and the some of the things I try to talk about is like my form of activism in a way. Um, so being able to like, 
own the space. Like I felt like I was doing at the New Blood Festival at, ne at uh, Lynx Hall. I felt like I was owning the space. There's me, I'm KO. Yeah, I go to the school, there's my city, this my world. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say in a lot of my art that like I'm here and this is how I feel about a lot of these things. And if I have an issue with certain socioeconomic things, I'm going to address it because I have the right to address it. And you're just gonna hear me out. I feel very, you know, if any of you have seen like photos, like my promotional photos or performance photos, I feel like I have very like intense or angry look on my face a lot of times. And uh, I would say that generally that's not how people really know me. They know me, I think as more of a cheerful person and everything, but with my art, you know, I've just kind of realized that most of my art is about how I feel about a lot of things that I feel like are kind of fucked up. And I feel the need to be serious when I'm discussing these things, you know. Um, I think that art should have like maybe the same intensity as the shit that it's talking about sometimes. So I do understand that sometimes if, so if I'm doing a song that's about domestic abuse and one verse is from the perspective of the victim and then another verse is from the perspective of the abuser. And I'm putting like the same emotional intensity in both of them. I'm playing both of those characters, but that's, I don't know, it's just, that's what the muse kind of leads me to do. And it, it, I feel like that's the way I have to address it, you know? I've been rambling, you know. <laughs> It's been exciting, your ramble. <laughs> I know that Brett has experience uh, going to the Art Institute too. So. Oh, so do you too. So <laughs> I do too. Yeah, you do too. We all do, so it's okay. Uh, but, uh, um, oh, uh, Karma says, what did, hold on, the train's going by. We, ha we have to wait for the train. Uh, Karma says, uh, she has a couple questions. She's okay. she is like, uh, we'll we'll start with the what did you get out of your experiences at SAIC because you just recently graduated, and then she has a second question that said, would you say your art is, has myth mythological symbols and elements in it as well as political elements? And I'm gonna stop. Actually, uh, can you stop sharing the screen until we're, uh, till yeah. yeah, that's better, then we can see you bigger. Yeah. Um, and uh, she, and then also, there were some questions here. Well, well, there was also uh, Jay asked, "Are you familiar with Sun Ra?" Oh yes, yes. <laughs> and um, uh, and then earlier on, you were talking about your kids, and Jay was talking about it's been a real pleasant surprise, including my children in my practice. Jay says. Yes, and maybe you've included yours. So those are a lot of questions, and they're in the chat. <laughs> I think I got it, but I, I can refer but to. I, but I also they're in the they're in the chat, and I and I can ask the ones that you don't answer. Okay, I can re-ask. <laughs> okay. Um. Yes, I I am aware of Sun Ra. Um. I did not know about Sun Ra when I first adopted the name Ko Razin. Um. I became Carol Razin in 1998. I think I discovered Sun Ra probably two or three years later via like Napster and stuff. You know, Napster introduced me to a lot of music and I bought a lot of new music because of Napster. So to go against the whole myth of people just still, Napster made me kind of expand like the stuff I listen to, you know, uh, cause I like having like physical, uh, you know, media, you know, CDs and records and stuff. Um, yeah, and, and, and since I've discovered Sun Ra, I've, uh, you know, I've seen Spaces to Place a few times. I've owned it on DVD before. I've, uh, I've seen the uh, orchestra at, uh, at uh, Link's Hall or Constellation uh, a few years ago. I had tickets to see them on Easter last year, but that was canceled due to COVID. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm very much aware of Sun Ra. And since I've discovered him, I've, not to say, you know, yeah, he, Samurai does what Samurai does and he's a legend and, you know, I do what I do, but there are 
some things that I kind of notice that make me feel like th there's a some uh, a, a a kindred kind of creative spirit in a sense. Um, as far as uh yes, there is a lot of like mythological uh, references in my work, in my um, poetry, is in, in 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 my rap. I do reference a lot of. You know, occasionally I reference reference some biblical kind of things. Uh, uh, I'm working on an album and um, entitled "Time of the Signs," and um, yeah, kind of prophecy is a theme on the album. Uh, biblical themes are kind of run throughout the album. The resistance, resistance movements, is a, a theme that kind of runs through the album. Um, this album is being done. Most of the production is being ha handled by Silas and, and Yoda Rock, who are members of the Nacrobats Collective. And uh, the album will also guest star a few members of the Nacrobats. And um, it will be released on Culture Power 45, which is a local indie hip hop label in Chicago run by Taiwan Davis and Infinito of the Nacrobats crew. Uh, so with this album, I'm definitely, uh, it's, it's going to be a more hip hop centric album instead of more like performance art and alternative stuff, though there will be some overlap into that, but this is me like, okay, let me just make a hip hop album. And then after that, I'll go do be weird artists and all the other <laughs> ways. Um, okay, my experience at SAIC. Um, you know, I, I, I dropped out of Columbia, you know, to focus on my family and my career. But uh, eventually I would go back to school and take a class here and there. Um, I got an associate's degree from Harold Washington College in 2015. And then uh, I was uh, accepted into the School of the Art Institute a few years later. Um, so, well, I, I had a, I went and visited UIC. Northeastern was a consideration. I kind of didn't care where I was going to go. I wanted to, you know, I knew I wanted to get my bachelor's degree, but the art institute was where I wanted to go, you know, and I kind of felt like if they offer me money, I'll go there. If they don't give me money, I'll go anywhere else. I don't care. So I was awarded a presidential merit scholarship, uh, which covered about half the tuition, uh, which helped me out a great deal. Uh, last year, I was able to get a Dean's grant as well. They helped me you know, pay for some things. But uh, so getting a scholarship really sealed it for me. Like, wow, you know, I'm accepted into the Art Institute, the school where, um, of course, now I can't think of uh, the artists, but, uh, you know, there have been like many uh, famous artists that have taught there, that have uh, attended there. And um, so I, I intended to make the most out of my experience uh, while I was going there. Um, I benefited greatly. I think from going to school. And um, I think being there for a couple of years really helped me understand exactly who I was as an artist. Uh, not saying that I couldn't have figured that out outside of that school experience, but you know, before, yeah, I was a poet, I was a rapper, I was a painter, I was a dancer, I was all these kind of disparate things, but some kind of way going to SAIC made me kind of feel like I could synthesize all those kind of things into like one kind of identity, uh, poet, artist, performer, curator, you know, so that's kind of what, what I uh, settled on. Um, right after I graduated, uh, in, so in the months after that, I really went to work on uh, putting my website together and uh, really fine tuning all of my um, social media and all the places I, I met online. So I really worked on a lot of that. So I think really some of that kind of um, was was influenced by me going to school and being in those um, professional practices classes and those uh, senior capstone classes and you know having visiting artists come to the school and kind of talk. Uh, I mean, I would say primarily I'm a rapper or people know me as a rapper, but I also feel like I feel like I present myself to the world as more of a performance artist or more of a more artsy artist instead of a rapper. Um, you know, I don't know. But uh, I think going to school definitely uh, 
uh, helped me out with that. I appreciated the experience. I do understand uh, why people don't like going to school or, you know, but me, I was committed to going through it, to going to school full time while working full time, while being a practicing artist, while, you know, I was just committed to kind of getting it done. So it didn't bother me. You know, it was rough getting there towards the end, but um, I wanted to get it done. So, yeah. That's awesome. I, um, it also gives you this time that you're supposed to, you're supposed to work on your art. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the things. Um, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, you're supposed to have the time to work on your art. <laughs> But I had already taken like a lot of, I had yeah. already had a lot of studio credits. Yeah. Well, I um, I can't hear very well because the train oh. just went by. <laughs> uh, my, my last semester, I took my senior capstone class in four art history classes. Whoa. Yeah. So the, That's a lot of art history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 was, that was pretty rough. But, but, but I got through it. And, um, but okay, one thing about my experience, you know, everybody's unique in everything. But one of the things about my experience of going to school and one of the things that I made a point to stress to many of my professors, it's like, hey, I'm here to do the work. I'm here, I'm gonna be here, come to class, I'm committed. But I'm also in my mid forties, also have a full-time job and I'm a manager and work comes home with me and I'm a practicing. So I just kind of let them know, like, not saying that nobody else is busy. I'm not trying to, I'm just saying this is where I am in life. So, you know, what I'm saying? just, just kind of letting them know, you know, every assignment I turn in isn't going to be this 100% mind blowing thing that I just put so many hours into, because I might not have that many hours to do it, you know. I've been going to college on and off for 27 years. I'm here to get the piece of paper. So toward the end, I wasn't trying to really have that an attitude, but I was just trying to be realistic and let my professors know, this is where I am in life. I'm already a practicing artist and a curator and all these things. Here it is, I can show you. All right, now let's, let, what, what do I have to do to pass this class, you know? Practical. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the one thing that we didn't talk about is like maybe you including your kids in your art yes. as they were uh, growing up. That was asked a while ago, but when okay. when you were talking about your family, because I'm not looking at the chat because I'm like rambling. It's okay. I'm 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 doing it for you. All right, and I see we have more time here, so we're we're pretty good. We're doing good. We're okay. we're great. And also, okay. I I, I want to see some of the the other videos that we're allowed to have on our video yes yes, yes. Can show those like so answer this question and maybe we go back to you talking about the art mm -hmm. okay. that you, you prepared to share okay. <laughs> um, we're still recording yeah 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 we we, we still recording <laughs> folks it's still a go um <laughs> as far as my uh children um yeah, all, all of my kids are creative in, in, in different ways. Uh, my oldest daughter works at a salon in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, every day she's kind of posting the different cuts and colorings and stylings that she's doing on all kinds of heads, you know? So, um, uh, you know, I think that's how her creativity is manifested. She's also posting a lot of cooking photos and everything she's making, it looks so colorful. And, and it, it looks so good, but I'm a vegetarian, so I can't eat most of it, but it still look good and everything. So uh, so it's cool to see that's how it seems like her creativity is manifesting. Uh, my son, uh, you know, of course, uh, when he was young, yeah, he would draw and make like things. And, um, uh, but now I think, um, you know, I think right now he's more into like video games and, 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 and uh, skateboarding and longboarding and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my other daughter is a photographer and a videographer and also an occasional visual artist. And we've all, we've collaborated. Uh, she's uh, filmed like a few of my music videos. Uh, I, we'll watch a, a clip of uh, at least one of them. And, um, you know, occasionally she's able to come to my shows and uh, document. And that's another thing I got from going to SAIC. Even though I was already kind of documenting a lot of my stuff in uh my uh, transfer class when I first got to uh, whatever the name of that class was, uh, 
uh, when I first got to SAIC, my professor, one of the things he said was document everything. So I try to document as much as I can because I think one of the things about becoming an artist and especially if you're not like always active on the scene, I feel like you don't always feel like you're an artist. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of times in my life where it's kind of like either I myself made myself feel that way or maybe I allowed other people maybe to make me feel that way or, oh, you're not really an artist. You're not doing enough or, or whatever. It's like, I guess I'm not. Yeah, you're putting out albums and everything and I'm just, you know, whatever, raising my kids. So yeah, you're better than me, I guess. Uh, but when you, when you document everything, <laughs> Uh, when you document stuff, like over a period of time, it's kind of like, wait a minute, I've done a lot over the last couple of years, you know, you kind of realize that like, yeah, maybe, maybe at that time, I'm not as prolific as maybe some other people, but you know, maybe that was their time to shine. So, you know, my kids are grown now, so you can't stop me now, motherfuckers. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, you know, when you document everything, I think you get to go back and look at it. You get to see how you've grown and developed and, and, and everything. And that's something I can definitely uh, tell. So uh, my daughter has documented a lot of my performances. We've uh, collaborated on some videos. She's taken like some photos for me. And um, we can uh, watch a uh, little bit of a video if you like. Yes. All right. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, and um, you know what? Maybe because of the, the because of the importance, I think of this video because I think this kind of signaled an, another mark in my development as an artist. And um, uh, maybe I'll just play. It's a three three minutes and three seconds. So maybe I'll just play it, and maybe we'll watch. Yeah, play it. Just make it full screen, mm -hmm. and then play it, and uh, let's see it. Okay, uh, so this was filmed by Azia Fulton, aka Slim Jim, uh, my daughter, and it's a collaboration with my uh, brother in law, Ness the God. There are new developments in the death of George Floyd, the unarmed black man in Minneapolis who died in police custody. We're hearing from the paramedics who treated him. And now the mayor says he wants the police officer who pressed his knee to Floyd's neck to be prosecuted. CBS's Jeff Begay's reports yeah, yeah. from Minneapolis. It's all good when you tear your city up after a championship. But when you protest, the media dismantle that shit. They call us thugs and criminals, say we started a riot. When a black man dies, all lives matter quiet. God bless America, land of the contradictory. The country with the most terrorism up in its history. Kaepernick, Joe DeNeal, you see disrespect. Same reason George Floyd got a knee in his neck. Fuck you, respect. We see it often, another coffin. It's white supremacy bullshit, dog getting exhausted. No asphyxiation of all Autopsy reports now off to the paperwork and drop the charges in court. Back. We see the scheme manipulation up in the system. Dig up prior arrest and take away from the victim. Uh -huh. The media twist up the shit and try to make it justified. You know it. And you wonder why we fucking tired. I'm tired. Not sure how much more I can go because my eyes get low and I'm tired. God damn it, I'm tired. I say motherfucker, I'm tired. Not sure how much more I can go Cause my eyes get low and I'm tired Motherfucker, I'm tired Here we go with this shit again Pigs still killing unarmed black citizens the sight was endless and this senseless police occupation got us ducking in the trenches. Judging executed even when a brother innocent. Police you, you're working for a guilty cop's benefit. They don't really give a fuck about laws when they try to choke you out without probable cause. I got a right to stand a stand for right. We don't survive the him Miranda rights. They about to force a black man to fight. I ain't trying to have my family holding vigils in my memory by candlelight. So now what I'm poised to do is be a voice for truth. I'm seeing Red looking at these boys in blue George Floyd's life taken seen from heaven by his mother's eyes And you wonder why I'm fucking tired I'm tired Not sure how much more I can go Cause my eyes getting low and I'm tired God damn it, I'm tired I say motherfucker, I'm tired Not sure how much more I can go Cause my eyes getting low and I'm tired Motherfucker, I'm tired The new cell phone video shows the initial arrest. 
Officers are seen taking George Floyd out of his vehicle. In surveillance video obtained by CBS News, a handcuffed Floyd is walked across the street toward a police car. In the distance, you can see Floyd fall. In this newly circulated video, three officers of Floyd's been... All right, so uh, yes, that was I'm Tired with uh, Nesta God, and that uh, was released on the uh, 4th of July, 2020. And that uh, was a direct uh, response, reaction to uh, the killing of, of George Floyd, and um, which really affected me. Um, it's 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 like it's a point like it's a point that will be marked forever in history, like just you know in our country, in the world, in 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 in, in myself as well, and how it impact me impacted me and um, how it just maybe strengthened my kind of uh, resolve to want to like talk about a lot of these things and to like just 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 really just bluntly address them. Um, so that song was, you know, just came out of a conversation that me and Ness had, you know, I think we were both black men feeling very fucked up. And, um, you know, I forgot who reached out to who, uh, um, we were checking on each other to make sure we were okay. Cause that was kind of going on. Uh, a lot of uh, black folks were kind of checking in with each other. And, uh, you know, I think he said we should do something, you know, it's like, yeah. So we, uh, he came up with the beat, he wrote the song, uh, filmed the video. Uh, my daughter filmed it. I edited the video together with the help of my daughter. And I used like the found footage, which I've kind of doing a lot of my videos now, uh, footage of Fred Hampton, black Panthers and, um, uh, footage from uh, Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. Uh, I didn't want to show any actual footage of, of like, I didn't want to show like footage of like Chauvin on like Floyd's neck or anything like that. So I was more comfortable showing like uh, the scene from the movie with the police uh, choking radio Raheem. Uh, so this wasn't made to be part of any kind of project or anything. It was just kind of made to be its own thing. But I think um, this also kind of maybe show people, show like my crew and other people that like, no, I'm a serious rapper. Yeah, I've been doing this other stuff and everything, performance art and everything, but no, I'm a rapper and I talk about like these issues and things like that. So it was uh, a little bit after this where I was approached by uh, Taiwan of a uh, Culture Power 45, the record label about uh, doing a, an album. Um, early in 2020, we had a Nacrobats reunion show that was, oh my God, so many people showed up and it was a great response. Um, I remember that, like a lot of people were talking about that, you know. It, it, it was cool. Well, Pugs Adams, the founders of the Nacrobats, I think he, he started talking about how like we need to give ourselves our own flowers and not wait for other people like us as a crew. We got to show the world like, no, we giving ourselves our own flowers. And that's why we put out like this album um, in late 2019. That's like a compilation of some of those like mid 90s to early 2000s or recordings. And uh, so I have a song on here and, um, you know, so this really kind of, you know, I appreciated being a part of this and it, it, it kind of brought like renewed interest into uh, our crew and I think into me and like some of my like early work. So we put out that album. We also put out a book called A Love Supreme. Um, and it's basically an oral history of the Nacrobats crew. So if you purchase this book, this is the second printing with more pages and everything. And you can uh, go to my website and there's this kind of yellow A in a square symbol in the lower right hand corner of, my, of the homepage. You could click on that and that'll take you to this page where if you want, you could purchase this book. Oral History of the Nacrobats has got like photos from like the 90s. So you can see old photos of me old photos of, of my wife, you know, uh, and the crew. And on the back of the book is a piece of creative writing that I wrote specifically for this book 
and uh, called uh, Invisible Pyramids. And it's kind of like me summarizing like what I felt about the mid nineties uh, hip hop scene in Chicago. And Pugs put it on the back of the book. Oh my God, you know. <sighs> um, well, like one thing I will say when I wrote that piece, I feel like it's a piece of creative writing it wasn't like a straight, I joined Acrobats here and whatever. It was more of like a creative piece and I'm worried about it. And my daughter was living with me at the time and I like let her hear it. And I was like, oh, is this too out there? And I sent it to Pugs and he's like, no, this is good. Then when I got the book and I'm like, oh, he used, he's using it to, to sell the book. Oh my God. So uh, I have noticed that like some of the things that I, I, I'm the most concerned about are the things that sometimes get the best response. Um, because I, you're putting yourself out there. You're putting yourself out there, yeah. Um, so I have one uh, last video for that's for this recorded presentation, if you guys want to take a look at that. And this is a song from my new album. And it's actually going to be the first song on the album. And, um, you know, I've been using found footage in a lot of my videos in different ways. With this video, it's all found footage, no footage of me. And I'm using footage from one of my favorite movies, uh, Metropolis, uh, directed by Fritz Lang, uh, released in 1927, uh, uh, German sci-fi, maybe the first sci-fi film. So let's take a look at uh, Advent from the upcoming album, Time of the Signs. It was the year when they finally immanentized the eschaton. The world is on fire. Beware all ye that enter here. The end is near. You pray for God to interfere. The hearts of men are insincere. These chaotic times have been engineered. Mass has grown critical. Cash has gone digital. It's getting pivotal for every individual, whether conservative or liberal. And it's one nation divisible, but it's all geopolitical. On and on and on, it's all cyclical. Things are predictable, but everybody keeps just acting typical. It's gonna be a long dark night, you better get right with your metaphysical. Cause things starting to feel real biblical. Bump the trouble on base, the whole world's about to be leveled to waste. I'm trying to settle a place where I see angels and devils embracing heaven and hell. It's time to see my brethren rebel. The clock's racing, it's got me pacing from 11 to 12. Some people are folding for the pressure. Out here fight for scraps for others are holding on the treasure. Uncertainty could turn a strong man timid. Everybody getting put to their damn limits. They want to shoot a bullet or a vaccine into my human body. Is it all a scheme of the Illuminati? Everything is being redefined. So free your mind. Gotta read between the lines to see the sign. And that's the Nacrobat A in a square right there. 
Uh, all right, so uh, that was Advent, which is the first, gonna be the first song on the album. And um, definitely, I did not write to the movie, but a lot of the things, you know, the movie was very, uh, someone uh, used the word prescient, you know, the movie, you know, there's a lot of things that I talk about in my own work that syncs up with what people have been talking about in literature and, and film like forever. So uh, a lot of these things uh, that we're talking about in this country and the world, a lot of these issues are issues that have been talked about before, you know, uh, when you, you know, at, at, the, at their base, you know, uh, uh, you know, the income disparities and, you know, uh, people, you know, working for slave wages, basically, and, you know, the, the haves and the have nots and the uh, yeah, prophecy and these these crazy times we're living in and everything. So uh, I was able to just kind of sync up things from the movie with like some of the stuff I was uh, writing and it just kind of seemed to work. So we're gonna like open it up and if people have questions they haven't asked, but mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, I one is I did ask you like what is your advice to young artists, especially because you've had such a varied, you know, work and art life. And mm -hmm. what is your advice to young artists? Um, well, I told you earlier that I had. A <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> had to figure it out. <laughs> um, well, before I say that, I, 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 before I get to the condensed uh, bit of philosophy or advice, I will say that um, I am very much uh, inspired by what I see from uh, young people and young artists and um, seeing them develop. And um, it, it's, it's just great to see. And I appreciate seeing you uh, offer a space for people to kind of uh, have some place to go to work on their craft and find out who they are as, as artists. Um, okay, so my advice for young artists, and because it's something I kind of feel like I've just kind of, it works for me. Um, do what the fuck you want to do. Do what the fuck you want to do, but make sure that you can pay your own goddamn rent. And to me, that's like it, you know, like all the other stuff is, you know, yeah, try different things, do things outside of your comfort zone. If you feel confident in something, feel that confidence. I, I definitely think one of the things that's been working for me over the last couple of years, I feel like my work is becoming more polished I'm, uh, more things are intentional that I'm doing. And it's just kind of me kind of taking control of my own shit and kind of doing what the fuck I want to do. And I'm, I'm open for advice and critique and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But everything that somebody says to you, you don't have to heed everything, you know, cause people have different motives when they say things to you. And I'm, I'm, I'm really seeing that people that like, maybe you think are your friends and that they're saying things to you. And it's kind of like, they might not necessarily be as supportive of you and your creative endeavors as you would like, you know, for whatever reason, you know. Uh, people, they bring their own things to the table. Right, right. They bring their own things to the table. They project a lot onto you. Um, and it, especially me being a rapper, one of the things I feel like this, a little different with the hip hop scene than some other art scenes that would probably exist in these other art scenes. I feel like if you're a rapper, it seems like people automatically rate you either as successful or a failure, depending on whether or not you're commercially like successful as a hip hop artist. So if you're like an underground artist that's just like doing it, I feel like everybody's kind of like judging you. It's like, they don't accept you where you are. They're like projecting like, oh, you should be bigger than this or uh, you can't be happy with where you are right now because you have to think about becoming a millionaire or whatever. So it's kind of like 
sometimes you have to like tune all that stuff out and just kind of do what the fuck you want to do, but make sure you could pay your own damn, damn rent. You know, be a self-reliant adult, a self-reliant artist as much as you can. Build your network. But um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's it. And, and, and another piece of advice, school was beneficial to me, that experience. I feel like the, the best critique that I ever got on my work was at school. Um, instead of someone just kind of maybe listening to something and kind of being like, uh, it's okay, uh, or it's dope, you know, it's kind of like at school, the critiques I had at school, I feel like the professors and the cla my classmates, it's, people were more willing to meet the artists where they were instead of expecting the art to meet like their expectations and, 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 and things like that. My other question um, is, uh, is um, what do you envision for the future? I know you're like working on this album and it's about to drop, but like, what are, what are the kinds of things that you want to do in the future? And maybe talk about that, but also make sure everyone knows about your album. Okay. Yeah, y'all will. The album, <laughs> time and the times. Yo, yo, check this shit out. Yo. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll probably be working on the album for another couple of months, you know, uh, to finish up the last few songs. Uh, over half of the songs are like recorded and finalized. Uh, I just have to do some, some writing for these, these last few songs and get those kind of mixed and mastered. Uh, there's a, a couple more videos that are going to come out. Um, Avent. You know, you just saw Avent. There's another video I have on YouTube, God Bless. Uh, that's gonna be on the album as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there's a few more things I'm kind of working on mm -hmm. and um, I'm excited for everybody to hear it. I think it works as, a, as an underground album, mm -hmm. but I also think it works as something people can listen to who maybe aren't familiar with underground hip hop. I think it will be like palatable in some ways for for the casual uh, listener. And uh, with a lot of the samples and a lot of the themes, like it will address like where I am in my life now and where we are in the world right now. Um, so there's that, Time of the Science coming out uh, later this year. Um, a couple more music videos. You're gonna see a brand new music video tonight, but after we stop recording. And um, also have some performance art stuff kind of coming up. Um, but that will be later, like one thing in the fall and then another thing in the spring. And there's some other stuff I've been submitting to and waiting to hear back from. I'm also uh, researching uh, schools. Uh, I want to go to graduate school. So I get my uh, master's degree in creative writing. Uh, I'd like to teach uh, some uh, creative writing classes at the college level one day in my life. And I'm also looking for regular like art teaching jobs. Um, so I'm kind of been interviewing for that. So we'll, we'll see, you know, I'm flexible, you know, it's kind of like I have goals, but I don't care so much about these like individual specific goals. My main goal is that like, like last year I put out my first ever like music videos. In February, I put out Morning in America. In April, I directed a video for a friend of mine, Killing in the Name of Love by Dodo Mafioso. I put out I'm Tired. You know, that was all last year. This year, I've already put out Advent and God Bless, and you're going to see another new video. So for me, there's all the specific goals, but I just feel like as long as I keep progressing and as long as I'm active, I'm going to keep doing more. My network is going to expand and, you know, my things will become more polished and, and I will figure out my specific artistic identity even more. So I'm more so, I'm thinking about like, the long term, you know, instead of like, oh, I gotta put this record out right now. Oh, I gotta, everybody gotta know I'm the dopest rapper right now. Like, I don't care so much about that. It's, it's about the life, you know. So we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. Last chance, if anybody wants to ask questions who is, who's not on the video, you can ask in the chat or you can ask uh, the thing. But yeah, great to hear, hear voices, other people that are in here, if you have anything you want to say. Um, 
I'm gonna say that like, thank you, Kenya, for being on the video, K.O. Razan. It's been wonderful hearing about your work and getting, I, I got to know different parts of you that I didn't know because I knew you in a little slice, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was amazing. And I was really happy. Um, anybody else have a question? Last chance? No questions? I mean, does Mariana have anything to say? Uh, I don't know, you know, just uh, talk about it. Oh, thank you. So, no, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, really wonderful insight and uh, bravo. Congratulations. Keep going. All that good stuff. Thank you. Yay. Well, thank you, Mariana. <laughs> You're definitely uh, somebody that's uh, who, 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 I, who I met in my life and learned a lot from. And, um, you know, you kind of, you're, you're, you're a role model, uh, to me, you know, and a, and a friend. So, and you are one too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kao. Check social media for future zooms and future streams. <laughs>